being exposed to it and understanding what it was and like after that I feel like the level of passion hasn't really changed it's just like the skills and the progression happens throughout your journey as an angler I feel like a, that that fire is always there to go out there and catch a fish for whatever reason. I still don't know why. Like people ask, like, will camera using a camera like take away from the experience, like being out there filming? For me, it adds to it. Adds so to it. you have to be fully into what you're doing. Yeah. You really want to like have the drive to pursue it for the sake of what it is, not for the success, for the money. I literally was doing it with no prior experience or knowledge whatsoever. Anyone can get into it. Yeah. The biggest thing I've commonly seen with saltwater anglers going in the, in freshwater is it's more of a short game. I wouldn't say it's like mini golf, but you're not making 80-foot casts. Um, you're fishing rods that are half the weight of a saltwater rod. If you're fishing, you an A weight. Today we're fishing a four weight. Oh my goodness. They're smaller rods and turning over a dry fly is a lot ter- different than turning over a weighted fly. It's a, it's just a more delicate ball game. You're dealing with a smaller fish on smaller tackle and smaller water. Flies and bugs and it's just like really fun to nerd out on all that. Dude. About trout fishing. There's just so many little avenues you can go down. We're next to the road. All right, guys, welcome to another edition of the Skiff Wonder podcast. Today, I am in Montana. I guess the last podcast I was in Montana, too. This one, I'm in a different part of Montana, and I am sitting on the side of a road, so cars are going by. We couldn't get the permit to shut down the road so we could podcast here. Uh, we did try. And my guest today is Mr. Will phelps it's with a ph like mike (laughs) right (laughs) so if you need to know how to spell it that's how you spell it's like uh yeah like michael phelps yeah i don't really swim very fast though he's and i'm not related in case you're wondering yeah you swim better than i do as we learned today (laughs) yeah we did learn that today that's a well we can go into that later in the podcast all right so um where'd you grow up when you start fishing i grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and I started fishing when I was really young. Yeah, I didn't fly fish until I was in college, but I started fishing when I was young, catching brim, bass, gar. I remember I caught a gar and it got tangled up in my line, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever when I was like 12. But yeah, I always liked fishing, never was super into it. I was more into skateboarding and mountain biking and extreme sports, quote unquote. And for me, fishing didn't really click as like a passion until I was in college and was introduced to fly fishing and um, that was when I was 19 my friend Duncan Connolly shout out to Duncan skunk the skunk master he uh, told me about fly fishing he's a good friend and he's like yo let's go fly fishing and I was like sweet well I need a rod so I bought a rod about a Winston passport the cheapest Winston out there great fly rod and we went and caught some bass well, tried to catch bass. I didn't catch one. He caught a bass. I tried to catch a bass on the fly. And after that, we went to a local tailwater and tried for some trout with woolly buggers on like 5X. Didn't know anything about it at the time, but caught that first fish. And I thought it was, you know, a really cool experience and couldn't stop after that. It was basically just an addiction. Yeah. Just could not shake it. That's led to become most of your life. Pretty much from that moment on. For yeah. real, like the last couple of years of college, I did not stop going down to that river. It was every weekend during the week. I would skip class and just sit, just go fish instead. And it wasn't even really good fishing, but at the time, I thought it was so cool to catch like a ten inch fish on a dry fly. Like to me, that was a huge deal, and I thought it was cool, so I did it a bunch. Um, all it took, was, uh, yeah, just being exposed to it and understanding what it was, and like after that. I feel like the level of passion hasn't really changed. It's just like the skills and the progression happens throughout your journey as an angler. And I feel like that that fire is always there to go out there and catch a fish for whatever reason. I still don't know why. Motive, I do not have an answer to that, but it's just fun. Yeah. We got a Polaris going by. Out for a rip. (laughs) 
Dude, that's what we need for a shuttle. A nice Polaris. Yes, Polaris sponsor us. Yeah. Sponsor Skiff Wanderer. And maybe you can pull us tow his skiff around with the Polaris too. Go out on the beaches of Texas. I hear that you need yeah. to be in off roading mode to do that. Oh yeah. We'll get you down there. Um so through college you started fly fishing and you know, I kinda mentioned that that's what you do almost full time. What was like the progression into what you do and what do you do now? Yeah, it when when I was in college I wanted to graduate and become a fly fishing guide. That was like the to me I was that was like my goal. I, which had nothing to do with my classes or where I was going with my career out after college or grad school or any of that. I was like, oh, I'll just guide for a couple of years, maybe go to grad school because I studied geology in college and you kind of need to go to grad school to f- have a career in that. So like, yeah, I'll go guide for a couple of years and then go to grad school and it'll be great and then I'll start my real career. <laughs> just go mess around the West for a couple of years. And after guiding for two seasons in Montana, I loved it, but I didn't really see that as my end all career for yeah. me. I just didn't have, I didn't have the passion for it that I thought that I would have. Like I do fishing. Like I like actually fishing, not taking people yeah. fishing all the time. I mean, like, I don't want to put down guiding, like guiding school. I have a ton of respect for guides and I'd guide my friends a lot. I guided you today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I even untied your knots. But it was, was fun. Like one time. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so getting a little sidetracked. But, yeah, got into filming while I was guiding. I got a camera, a really entry-level, like, mirrorless camera. And back in the time, it was, like, one of the first mirrorless cameras, I think. Yeah. A, a Panasonic GH2. Yeah. Old, like, eventually I got a GH5, and that's what really was, like, the beginning of my ca- camera career was getting that camera but the gh2 was great i just used that in the gopro and i eventually got a drone and just filmed fly fishing videos while i was guiding because the creek i was guiding on was just so cool i wanted to get videos and pictures and it just kind of slowly progressed into just wanting to take pictures of fish and then take pictures of the places i was into fish and then take pictures of fishing itself and and like the whole experience yeah like kind of what i do now but really worse production quality and storytelling (laughs) and that sort of stuff way entry level and um, by putting videos out there got me connected in in the fly fishing world with a photographer named brian gregson and also through a friend uh, carter at yellow dog he recommended that i talk to brian and reach out so um, he saw my videos he's like all right this kid is i guess okay i'm going to show him how to actually use a camera (laughs) so um, yeah, you had the I, eye for it. I had the eye for it. That's what he recognized is yeah. that I had the eye for it, even though I had no knowledge of anything. I just hit record in, in auto, fully automatic settings. The green A setting on the camera, I'd always had it set to that. <laughs> Didn't All I did was zoom in and out. Always had it in autofocus, too. <laughs> when was the last time you did anything in, in completely auto? In 2017, when I was filming those videos. That was the last yeah, time. I, yeah, think, I, I don't think say. I've ever fully put my camera in auto since I learned about manual. Once I learned how to put it in the M mode and use it, it's pretty much never gone back. I'll use yeah. aperture priority sometimes. I'll use shutter priority for certain things, but mm-hmm. pretty much manual settings are the way to go if you want to really learn how to use a camera and shoot cool stuff. So, yeah, slowly progressed into like making my own videos, and then I wanted to go work for Brian, and then we started making videos for other people, and he taught me kind of like the pro angle of using a camera, like how do you use this thing to make a living? Yeah. And how does it take you all over the world? And then the camera immediately became a vessel of traveling. Uh, within a month of working for Brian, we were in Argentina, which was kind of absurd. Like, looking back on it, I can't believe that he took me with him to Argentina on the budget for the shoot. Yeah. And, like, had confidence that I wasn't going to screw it up. And, yeah, we were down there for, like, two and a half months and going from lodge to lodge, shooting Yellow Dog Lodges, oh, shooting you, yeah. a Friends Lodge, like, lodge videos, still images, the full gamut. We just went from lodge to lodge to lodge in Patagonia, fishing and getting imagery of fishing for marketing material for companies and a bunch of different shoots along the way. We were down there. We got one plane ticket there, one plane ticket back, and while we were there, it's like, all right, let's just knock off a bunch of stuff. And then after that trip, I was like, wow, this is the path I want to go. Yeah. Not, not the guiding, not the grad school, <laughs> none of that stuff. Like, screw all that. I was like, this is the career, is being out on the water and, and seeing it 
seeing the whole fly fishing experience through a camera and the world through a camera. And, and fly fishing is just a vessel for traveling places and going cool places. In my opinion, you know, it's, the sport is really fun. You know, the act of catching fish is awesome, but it's the adventures that come about because of it. And then you throw the camera in the mix, then you're, you're an observer of those adventures and you just kind of take a step back and you can really see things through a different lens. Yeah. Pun intended. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, I don't know. After that, it, there was no turning back after yeah. seeing how it can be a career. Yeah. Seeing, seeing like, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe he had that in, in as part of his intention for taking you down there as yeah. being like, this is what you could get yourself into if you, if you keep doing this. There's some trickery involved for sure. What were you studying in college? I studied geology. Okay. Which I liked. I wasn't yeah. excelling in school. I never really excelled in school throughout my life. You know, um, I mean, I did if I put my mind to it, but I never like cared enough to like put my full energy into yeah, school. Yeah. My favorite things to put energy into were outside of school. So school was just something I had to do because society and my parents told me I have to go. Yeah. So like. I had to pick a major, and I was like, all right, if I'm going to pick any major, it's going to be geology because I think rocks are cool, and I'm a rock climber. So, <laughs> No, what I think is cool, though, is, like, you went from, like, not having – like, you didn't go to college for what you're doing now. No. You didn't do – you and just kind of happened to fall fall into it and fall in love with it mm -hmm. and then get on a, a good path. Um, like, what tips or advice would you give somebody that has been messing with a camera and they're thinking about getting into, like, full-time freelance work? You have to be fully into what you're doing. Yeah. You really want to like have the drive to pursue it for the sake of what it is, not for the success, for the money. None of that stuff can be your motive because if it is, you'll it's going to make it harder to get there. You know, it'll like the, for me the, it was always a labor of love. Like I wanted to use I, like fishing came first and using the camera was just a way to get out there and do it. And slowly it turned into like, now I like just using the camera to document fishing and I'm, and I enjoy it, like holding it while my friends catch a fish. It doesn't matter if I'm the angler or someone else is the angler. Someone just has to get it done for yeah. the camera. Whoever's the better stick, go out there and catch <laughs> the fish. Like, I don't really care, but it's just documenting how cool fishing is is like awesome to me and because I really care about it. And there's a lot of filmers who are in, in photographers who are into other outdoor sports, yeah. like climbing, you know, that's a very niche sport to be a photographer for. You have to understand r climbing s skills and techniques in order to just, go up on a big wall, started. Yeah. just to get started. So if, if you really want to be a filmer in the fly fishing world, you have to really love fly fishing. Like it has to be a, a huge passion of yours and you have to understand it on a, on a level that most other people might not. No. Cause you like, like you in the, in a lot of those situations, like you, when you're running a camera, like you need to know what's going to happen before it happens. So you have the camera pointed in the right direction. And so like a lot of times, you know, if, if you are going to be filming something like, you just, I don't, you just have to be like. You have to be fishy, yeah. like that. Like, remember the brown helps, we saw earlier? It helps so much. Like, if you're a fishy, like if you're fishy, because then, like, I think too, like, it makes everything going on on the boat easier. Like, if you don't love fly fishing and you don't really understand it, and you're trying to film it, like, you might be banging around in the boat because, like, there's tons of angles that, like, I think look amazing, but they're gonna require me, like getting out of the water while you're casting or leaning over the side where the whole boat like starts stops tracking the way it needs to track and and if you're trying to catch fish that might not necessarily right. be the best thing to do so you have to know when it's okay to get those shots yeah. it's like okay i i sense the fishing isn't good right now it's okay we can take an hour to get these shots because there's no hatch going on the fish aren't rising it's kind of shut off all right now is the t opportune time to take care of those really cool angles that i wouldn't otherwise get yeah. if we we're actually fishing hard and then when you know the fishing is good you have to anticipate it and be ready for it when it happens like you're saying so like in, if you don't understand those things it's going to be a lot harder to be a photographer or a filmer in the fishing world if you're actually trying to catch fish especially and a lot of my favorite content and shots and what I would like to think separates my work from other people's but I know there's a ton of other people out there getting great fishing porn shots 
triple X rated. <laughs> um, but you have to like know where the fish are. Like I love getting above on a high bank with a long lens and filming that trout and watching it feed. And like you learn a lot about fish that way, just observing them through the lens in that way. And like, if you don't understand fishing, you're not going to get those shots. The other thing too, though, is like, you also have to realize, um, you got to be willing to take the time and slow down because like, like some of those shots we got today, we could have easily just gone past there, but like, you know, we stopped, we like took our time, made sure everything was ready, like made sure like everything set up. Um, honestly, like filming for me, like, like I loved fly fishing as I started getting into photo and film work and then filming it like took my appreciation to a whole new level because so many times on the water, like you're just like, let's just take a minute. Let's, you know, like yesterday, like you wanted, there was an osprey that we were watching and we stopped and filmed it for a while. Um, and it's all those like little things that like, if you're just fly fishing, you, you may notice, you may not notice. That's why, like, that's why I love filming everything. It forces you to slow down yeah. and, ob and observe. You take it all in. It almost like people ask like, well, camera using a camera, like take away from the experience, like being out there filming for me, it adds to it. it adds so to it. it's harder to go fishing without a camera because if I do, then I'm just so focused on the fishing. I'm just like, fish this, fish this, fish this. Okay, next spot, next spot. Okay, like just casting nonstop, so laser focused on just trying to catch a fish. You just, it's tunnel vision. And when I have a camera, I put the rod down and it, like you're saying, forces you to slow down. You, and you get good shots. And then you get to enjoy the experience afterward when you rerun through some of the cool footage you got. And that's, that's a, that's a, you double down on the experience in that way, you know? And that's, and that's like one of my, like when I was going to sea, I, you know, I'd spend three, four months at sea and like the videos that I make were like help me get through, like they keep me pumped to go home and like, cause like, I mean, you're like no cell phone service, um, poor internet. So it's not like I'm going to go watch like new YouTube videos. So like I would rewatch really watch mine every now and then and, or like I'd be editing one from a old, from a trip that I did while I was home and just like being able to relive all those moments. It's just like, you're almost like there all over again, especially like if you're doing a really good job filming. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you get all the details. And you're documenting a place and time. Yeah. And you know, if you really break it down, especially the kind of work I like to do, just, you know, YouTube, straight up YouTube videos, adventure stuff like what we're doing now, the one that'll be linked at this, at the bottom of this podcast or whatever. <laughs> But it's just an adventure every time you go out fishing. And, and you know, every river is going to change over time. All the fisheries change. Our world's always changing. Um, there's one river might have a, like, get, you know, an invasive disease but, or an invasive species in it, and it might just ruin the fishing someday. And then, you like, if you document what that's like now in 2023 and 2025 or 2045 or something, it's... Yeah it's a different river or maybe the river dries up. It's like, wow, like this is what it used to be like. You know, you get to share that and remember it and you get to document things for what they are now and in, in this time in 2023 on the Missouri river here in Montana, this is what the fishing was like. And it's like, I don't know, you're kind of like keeping a log book or a journal in that sense of what every, how everything was going down. Cause it, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. No, I was just going to say with, like, with keeping a logbook in, in a journal, the other thing, too, that um, we've talked about it a little bit, and, like, you can go look at Will's YouTube channel. You can look at my YouTube channel. Like, if you are, like, serious about getting into film and photography work, just start doing it. Like, you just started doing it. Look where you're at now. I literally was doing it with no prior experience or knowledge whatsoever. Anyone can get into it. Yeah. And that's, and that's what I, like, like I always say, and I'll tell you, like, if you're listening to this, like, if you want to get into, like, film and photo, it doesn't matter what your background you want to get into. I just know most people listening to this are fly fishermen, but just start doing it. And then, like, the only thing that I would ask, and I think you probably agree, is just be respectful of the place you're in. You know, you don't have to give everything away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I try and conceal stuff in videos as much as possible, and I think everyone should do their best. Some stuff is worth documenting and filming because it's just so cool. Yeah. And just like with any cool spot, you want to share it with your best friends. Like, And not everyone does, but sometimes yeah. I do like to share things, especially with my fiance, Erica. Like if I find something really cool, I love to take her there so she can catch fish yeah. too. And then we can share that experience together. And that's what videos are. They, sh they allow you to share your experience with other people. And there's definitely value in that and in, in inspiring 
others to get out and go fishing rather than sit in a cubicle or sit on the couch. And like that's initially another reason I got into filming fishing too is just seeing cool content out there and being like, wow, that's something I would strive to do. The way watching that makes me feel is something I want to give to other people. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's that was like the whole drive for me. I was like watching, like, you know, being inspired by watching all these other videos and being like, man, I, like, I want to go do these activities, but I also want to like document it this way because like, it like watching a lot of those videos, they helped me get back in the outdoors because I quit like fishing, like as regular as I do now. I quit doing that for like six, seven years. Wow. Yeah, and like all those videos and stuff that somebody made, like they helped me like make the push to get back out here and here I am and here you are you're in Montana and you're you're living the dream you're doing this full time and like it all starts with a little spark of inspiration to go and do something and the same effect can be had on anyone out there that watches yeah. any of your videos like that can change someone's life and it's it's cool to take charge on your own life and do what you want to be doing because life is too short to be Way doing something short. you don't want to be doing and that's advice for anyone out there listening Go grab life by the balls. For you guys that have been listening to the podcast, following the channel, you you know I'm in the middle of a of a little bit of a road trip. I think I'm like two or three weeks into it right now. Um, I think like a month ago, I hit you up on Instagram. I was like, hey, I'm going to be in Montana. You want to go fishing? And you were like, left on red for like three days. And then you finally <laughs> texted me back. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Three days. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no. And then, so you invited me up here, um, to come hang out for a couple of days and this whole entire area is absolutely stunning. Do you want to say where we are? We already have, haven't we? Um, we can, we can say it. It's a pretty well, it's a well-known trout river. If you've seen the video, you'll probably know where it is, but we're we're in Montana on one of the biggest rivers in the United States. I think we can probably say where it is. It's the Missouri River. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. Um, no, and like for me, like that was on my, that's on my like, I guess, fishing bucket list of places. Like one of the places that I, like, I've always wanted to go and see and get to fish was here. So like when you texted and you're like, hey, like you want to go hang out on the Missouri? I was like, no way like I get to go fish this river this is gonna be awesome and like the landscape is absolutely stunning the fishing is gotta be some of the best fishing I've ever done it was absolutely it was funny because like the whole time you know leading into it, you're like this is super technical it's gonna be difficult like if we like catch like what was it like four or five fish like we're having a really good day yeah and we pulled that off two days in a row Two days in a row. Which, and what's funny though is like, you're like four or five fish, it's going to be a really good day. And I'm like coming from red fishing, like, yeah, okay, that's just another day. <laughs> <laughs> Normal fishing. Yeah. I mean, there's trout fishing days you can catch 50 fish, 100 oh, fish. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're really trying to catch them. But here when you're trying to do it with dry flies, it's a lot more challenging. There's a lot of room for error. A lot of things can go wrong. And you'll hook more fish than you actually land. Like, you're going to lose fish. Yep. If, with small tippet, small flies. It's just gonna happen. And big fish. And, and big decent, fish. Decently sized fish. Yeah, they're they're not tiny in general. Like there's a lot of nice fish. It was so cool. Like so, this is really like I've messed around on this trip. I've messed around with um, some dry flies. Like every everybody that I talked to as I came out here was like, it's hot, it's dry. Terrestrials, throw terrestrials. And so like I loaded up on those. I started throwing them. And, um, I feel like the last two days on the water though, that was really like my first like dry fly, like this is how we're going to get this done. And just to see the entire, like you get to, like it's sight casting. Like we were, we were spotting fish that were rising. We figured out exactly where they were. You wait for them so you can make the perfect cast. You blow that cast, you wait for them again to make the perfect cast, then the weeds get in the way, and then finally, like, on the third cast, you finally get a decent drift, and he just ignores it. <laughs> I think yep. we we threw at so many fish. So many. Oh, my goodness. The amount of fish that actually saw our flies or our flies went by, it's 
it's countless. Like catching five is like point zero 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 one percent of the fish that we actually cast it at. So the ratio of cast to landing isn't that it's great. Like, it's like identical to going fly fishing for redfish. Like you're gonna cast at a ton of fish, at least in Texas. You're gonna cast at a ton of fish, and you're gonna catch maybe ten percent of those, maybe three. Dang. Yeah. yeah, it's it's similar. I mean, it is akin to saltwater fishing in a lot of ways. Fishing tailwaters in general, yeah. especially with larger trout, you're, it's not a numbers game. And for me, a lot of it is the experience and not necessarily numbers because, like, you can just go down the rabbit hole casting at the same pot of fish or the same head over and over and over, and then an hour goes by and you're still casting at the same <laughs> fish. <laughs> so it's like it, you're... You know, there's better ways to catch fish than dry fly fishing. Yeah. You can catch a lot nymphing. You look, you were looking around while we were dry fly fishing, seeing a bunch of clients hooked up. Yeah. A bunch of pe- guided, guided trips. Nymphs. They're slaying. And, you know, we're choosing not to do that all the time. We did nymph. We chose to do it sometimes. There's times when it's like, all right, let's just, like, get one. But, they, I mean, there were, those were situations, too, where, like, a dry fly, like, wouldn't have... It kind of would have been like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Yeah. Throwing in some of those places. It's different fish. You're yeah. fishing to different fish. Right. And like I was telling you a lot while we were on the river, like the dry fly fish are a different fish. The nymphing fish out in the middle of the river, those are like they're two different yeah. ball games. And they don't really cross each other. Sometimes you got might get the random fish that'll rise way up to the hopper, which we've seen a couple of times. But, you know, the fish that are on the bank feeding heavily you know, you're not going to catch them with a big bobber and a split shot and a deep, a deep rig. It's just not going to happen. No, no way. But, um, God, when you get to catch those things, this, oh, I don't know, man. Like it was just like, especially, um, the last Brown that we, that you caught today. Like that was full on. You'll have, you guys will have to watch the video because I did dad cam it, but I managed to get something in there, but, um, he got the shot. He, uh, dude, it was like complete stock and like spot and stock, just going slow and just, oh man, that eat was perfect. Like, it, like I was watching it in slow motion. Like it's the eat that like you dream of like seeing and I like had a bird's eye view and it was just like 100% like in slow motion, like this, I don't know how big do you think, like twenty-two inch. Brown? It's probably around twenty, twenty-two. Yeah, it was a big fish. You know, like you could tell, rising up slowly and just like gulps it. Is literally what dreams are made of, especially with the hopper. And like these fish are out here chowing down on tiny, like size twenties all day long, and you think to yourself, "There's no way it would eat a hopper. If it won't even eat my size twenty trico spinner, like why would it ever eat this like ridiculous hopper?" But you find the right fish in the right mood. And, I, and when we were looking at it from on top of the bank, we were like, okay, that's a hopper eater. Because yeah. it was hovering just low enough b- below the surface that it wasn't actively feeding on tiny dries like a lot of the other fish were just mowing down bugs. This one was looking up, but he wasn't feeding. Right. So he's waiting for a meal to go by. But I don't think a smaller bug would have convinced it to, right, t- to right. rise all the way to the top. We would have put a trico spinner saw, in front of it. It would have just come right by. But he saw that plop of the hopper. And he 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 knew because he was probably already looking for hoppers, yeah. especially with how windy it was. All those hoppers are getting blown into the river, so if it's windy, like hoppers are a pretty safe bet. And this thing landed, and I'm sh- I couldn't see it from where I was at, but I knew where the fish was, and it was such a slow eat. I bet so you could see slow. it coming from the bottom, just oh yes, yeah. oh man. And like like the body language on him, like the whole time he was looking up. And you can just see, like, especially, like, like when that fly landed, like, you see his attention kind of change. And you see he's looking up, and he's just going back and forth real slow, and then just slowly raises up. And I, that's when it, when I saw him raising up, I'm like, there's no way. He's going to turn off of it. He's not, like, oh, his mouth's open. He's just going to miss it. And then, like, full on. It's magical. Eight. It's awesome. It's freaking magical. Yeah, that one's, good. that one's burned into my mind forever. Um, what brought you to Montana, though? My aunt's ranch, my great aunt has a cattle ranch in Tom Minor Basin, um, kind of near Yellowstone Park. And as a kid, I went there when I was three years old. That was my first time to Montana. When I was three, I went to Yellowstone. Um, 
at the time I was just doing tourist stuff, picking up rocks. I remember uh, my mom tourist always stuff. tells this story. It's a distinctive story of me just like filling up my pockets with rocks, walking around the woods, just wanting to take home every cool rock that I found. Beginning of the geology stuff too, I guess. But yeah, just, um, I, I didn't even fish, just a trip to Montana with the family. And then I came back once I started fishing and like throughout my life a few times and there's a little creek that ran through the ranch and I started fishing there. I keep going down the path of talking about fishing. You just asked me where like the first my first time to Montana. But I keep coming back because I, you know, found the fishing of course and that's kind of what brought me out here. I wanted to guide. Um, for me, watching Montana wild videos when I was in college was a big inspiration at the time. Um, they were putting out really cool content and I was like, oh Montana, that looks pretty cool. I have to go out there and check it out. So I went to guide school on the Bighorn River. Um, yeah, it's in Montana too. So, <laughs> the, yeah. And then that was my first like stop on my Western trout tour after college. Just loaded up my truck, drove out there, went to guide school, and then was like, all right, I might as well get a guide job in Montana while I'm here and look around. And ended up fishing the Madison for a while, fishing the Ruby, a bunch of other. I mean, we should probably bleep some of these out. Maybe this. Are you guiding them on? You're guiding them. No, not guiding. I'm uh, just like fishing. fishing and bumming around and basically looking for a guide job. Yeah, I guess. Like you. fresh out of guide school is like, all right, I'm just gonna fish and like kind of just try and look for a guide job. And now that I'm, I have I have the capabilities of getting a guide license and all this stuff. Yeah. So I just fished and fished and fished for like a few weeks um, with my buddy Carter Caputi. We had the salmon fly hatch on the Madison because that's legendary and. Every angler has to go see the Madison salmon fly hatch. It's like <laughs> the most hyped up thing in the entire world. Besides like maybe key Harpin or something. I don't know. The salmon fly Madison deal, it's it's very well known and popular. So we had to just see that for ourselves. And then, yeah, um, ended up at the guest ranch and got the job there. And then I was in Montana. But, yeah, I just knew it was good fishing. And I've spent time in Colorado, too. Yeah. Um, I forgot to mention that. Like that was my first, like, quote unquote out west place I wanted to go see like well like out west Colorado. It's like the closest to the south where I'm from in Georgia, like the closest drive, closer than Utah. Yeah, yeah. Closer than Montana. You and have Wyoming. to go through it pretty much. Yeah, you do. So it's kinda like the first stepping stone to going out west. Right. From where I'm from. A lot of people go to Colorado. And as a snowboarder I grew up going there and going on ski trips to like or snowboard trips to Keystone and Breckenridge and all this stuff. So I spent a summer actually in my truck in Colorado in college right after I learned fly fishing. I just wanted to go westward because the western idea and fishing just had that pull. Yeah. You know, as it does with mm -hmm. lots of people. Like, you know, you just kind of end up out here if you like the mountains. Um, but, yeah, that Colorado trip taught me that there's a lot of people there. It's a lot of tailwater fishing. Um, it's very mountainous and condensed, whereas Montana is spread out and the mountains are yeah. more sprinkled in, if that makes sense. And I really like the open space and just the less people. I mean, more people are moving here, of course, and there's, you know, a lot of hype about that. And I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> but to me, I don't really care. It's just a cool place to live. Really cool. Um, just like overall vibe, just being out here. It's a great great state it's definitely like the landscape like you were saying is super unique compared to like like most of the travel that i've done to the west has been called like a lot of colorado um and like a little bit of utah and then like i've i've touched part of idaho idaho i've come through like the westernmost part of montana where it's still like super it's more colorado feel like where all the mountains are super like close together Wyoming has mountains. Yeah. If like, <laughs> but like every time I drive through Wyoming, I end up going through like the eastern half of it, you know, which is all the plains. Like, I mean, I lived in Jackson for like three or four months, like for a snow season. Um, but this is like completely unique where like, <clears throat> you know, there's just, I, I don't even know how to describe like the landscape that this river's running through because it is literally, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it anywhere. It's weird. Yeah. It, it's, there's so many different facets of being here. There's the plains, which are flat, and those go on almost forever. That's most of the state is plains. Yeah. And you get to the mountains, and you have, like, the southwest Montana mountains, which are one type of geology, which has different vegetation and kind of more of, like, a sagebrush country feel to it. 
um, definitely some pines. And then, you know, you get in your riparian zones, like around streams with a lot of cottonwoods mm -hmm. and all these sorts of trees. And it has that, you know, kind of a classic Western feel. And then you go up to where I live in the Flathead and it's like Pacific Northwest kind of feel, you know, like mossy stuff and like only pines and like different types of pine trees and larches. And it's like, you, as soon as you go past Missoula and North of Missoula and Flathead Lake area, it's like totally, it feels like a totally different state than Montana. Yeah. First, if you spent like time in Southwest Montana, and you went up there, you'd be like, this feels like a totally different place. Just like you, if you just go to the East side of the state into the plains, it's there, it's a huge place. So like, of course, as you travel distances across a landscape, you're going to experience right. changes. So I don't know. It's just, there, I feel like there's just endless opportunity for exploration here, whether it's in the mountains or on the rivers. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, it was like driving through Montana. Uh, like I felt like every single river and I was coming across 90. So I ended up hitting 90 in Billings and then coming west on 90. But it seems like every single river that you cross that I crossed was like a famous trout fishing river. And like, it was really cool. The first night I camped, I camped on the Madison and it like, um, it had that like Montana feel that you always see like in all the videos that people shoot in Montana, where it's like, you see the big mountains off in the distance, the big range, and then you're down in this valley, but the valley isn't like, like a Colorado Valley where it almost looks like a, like a glacier valley, mm -hmm. but like the valley has its own like unique, like hills and swaths and draws and creeks and i don't know yeah it's unique it's super cool you started trout fishing in atlanta you've done a bunch of saltwater fishing what's what's some advice because because a lot of my viewership is saltwater based <laughs> what's some advice that you would give somebody that wanted to come from the saltwater and try their hand at catching trout Ooh, that's a good one that's a good one, especially after watching you the last couple of days. <laughs> the best thing I could tell anyone, and the biggest thing I've commonly seen with saltwater anglers going in the in freshwater, is it's more of a short game. I wouldn't say it's like mini golf, but you're not making eighty foot casts. Um, you're fishing rods that are half the weight of a saltwater rod if you're fishing used to an eight weight today we're fishing a four weight oh my goodness they're smaller rods and turning over a dry fly is a lot different than turning over a weighted fly you have to really cast perfectly like all the mistakes that you can get away with casting a streamer or a bigger fly with a heavier rod you can't get away with with a dry fly especially in the wind yeah and you have to on top of the casting game you also have to be really, really stealthy and quiet, especially here on, on the Missouri where we're fishing. It's a very stealthy ball game. And on the saltwater, you have to be stealthy too, but it's it's a different level when you're dealing with trout. You know, when your line lands in the water, you have to make it land super, super soft. Otherwise, they'll know you're there. They, I almost feel like, especially the fish we're fishing for now, they're really spooky. Not all trout are this way, but... It's a, it's just a more delicate ball game. You're dealing with a smaller fish on smaller tackle and smaller water. And because of that, you have to downsize your approach and really think objectively about what you're doing and um, not rush, you know. I mean, just like salt water, you don't want to rush that. Yeah. It's the same thing with fresh water. You want to go into it and really slow down if you can. Take quiet steps. Don't stomp through the water. You know, when you're rowing your boat... Um, especially on calm rivers, like where we're fishing. I keep comparing it to the Missouri just because that's where we fish. Yeah. It's a lot harder than most other trout streams, I would say. And it's a lot different. You know, some trout streams you can get away with flubbing your cast and rowing your boat and having squeaky oar locks and stuff like that. You can get away with, but not here. So it really, it'll take um, the things that you're not, it's just a different ball game. I mean, <laughs> there's just so many different things about it. I don't want it saltwater fishermen to feel intimidated by trout fishing no you know you shouldn't be because they're just they're just little trout you yeah. know <laughs> i mean one of the things that i've been doing on this trip that it's that i've been really excited about um is i have with me my seven weight 
Redfish setup. I mean, it's a it's a Gene Loomis NRX. It's got the same saltwater series reel from Ross that I that I've been using, and it's even got a Redfish Taper Monic fly line on it. And like I have like used that setup um, in Arkansas. I've used it in Colorado. I've used it now in Montana. Like we, it made a great nymph, like nymph rod. It was perfect for yeah. nymphing. Honestly, a seven weight is sweet for nymphing. And so, like, like if you're listening to this and you're like, "Well, I don't want to buy a bunch of new rods and stuff," like you've got the rods. Just come out here, and and it's the same thing. Like you go into a fly shop out here. You go into a fly shop back in Texas. Like everybody there's going to talk to you, and you know help you out. And then like everything that will just said there you go there's your approach so just come out here talk to some people you'll figure it out it's not it's just a little trout it's just a little <laughs> trout they're so cute compared to a redfish or a tarpon i mean you know in, like you get on like the trout we were on today like a 18 like a lot of those are probably in the the 16 to 20 inch range mm -hmm. in moving water like it's a whole like tiny tackle moving water like it's a it's a it's a good fight <laughs> yeah and i think that's what too many people think is like oh i'm gonna go out there and catch stalker rainbows and like you know little 12 inch rainbows that you can just sling into the woods on accident on a on a trout set <laughs> that's a good place to learn trout fishing oh it is 100 percent. but what I, I guess what i'm saying though is like you know learn on those fish and like realize like when you start fighting bigger fish out here like you you're gonna fall in love with it. You're gonna be making a road trip once a year out west. To just do more of it. Yeah, especially with wild wild fish and just like being in touch with that en environment and like kind of glimpsing into the natural world of these trout and seeing how they behave. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff can't be captured on an Instagram picture hero shot. You know, you see pictures of people holding trout and you're like, it, it's uninspiring. I've seen yeah. so much of it. Everyone's seen tons of that. And so it's uninspiring from an outside perspective to someone that doesn't know much about trout fishing. It's like, ah, oh, that do, uh, like that doesn't look that fun. Yeah. But once you get out and experience it, like we were doing today, and you get up on the high banks and you look and you see them eating dry flies, and you just experience the trout fishing, not even w with a rod in your hand. You can just walk around and just watch. Look at the cool. Look at the bugs. Look at the clouds of trichos, and like there's just so many other cool things to observe and take in besides the actual fishing that, that I think that's what a big part of what makes trout fishing so appealing to me and the technical aspects of it like you're you're intrigued by how many different flies there are yeah and how many different types of flies there are and then within those types there's types even subcategories oh there's just so many different types of flies and bugs and it's just like really fun to nerd out on all that Dude. about trout fishing there's just so many little avenues you can go down there's you know, Euro nymphing, there's nymphing, there's dry fly fishing, there's streamer fishing. There's like so many ways to catch a trout on the fly and they're all fun. It doesn't matter what you do. Everything is just suited for a different situation. So yeah. it just depends what situation you're in. Like, okay, this is a good fish to get on dry. Maybe we should nymph this hole. And there's just so many, there's just endless variety of experiences you can have trout fishing, which is, which is a really cool part about it. And it's a good place to cool off. Like, if you're in Texas in the summertime, like, just be able to jump in the river and, like, be cool. It's so nice. Yes. But, no, I I think anybody should come out. I mean, I think, honestly, like, if you were going to come out anywhere out west, as you're getting down to the river, you're going to be like, this is awesome. And then you haven't even started fishing yet. Because, like, the landscape alone is, you know, completely beautiful. I'm not going to get into it again. I already ruined it <laughs> once on this podcast. Yeah, there's a lot of good things to say about it, but it's cool. I'm glad you've had such an awesome experience out here trout fishing, and it was really cool seeing your reaction to the fish you hooked, especially that fir the very first fish yesterday, the rainbow that ate the zebra midge under the hopper. Very first fish of the day, first fish of the trip. I think your first rainbow in Montana. Mm -hmm. Like seeing how you fought it and reacted, like you could, you were like putting care into landing that fish. <laughs> you were fighting it like I like from coming from my world, going into saltwater. How I would fight a saltwater fish, like the same <laughs> feelings you get, the same excitement. You know, it's like oh, yeah. you don't. None of that changes from salt to fresh. It's just a different experience. But yeah. the stoke is just always there. <laughs> it really is, dude. It really is. All right, last question. Um, now, through your freelance work and work with Brian, you've gotten to travel and fish 
all over the world. So, if you had to pick one place to go fish, unlimited budget, you can go anywhere in the world, like where are you going and what are you fishing for? I would be going into the Pacific Ocean on a remote atoll, preferably literally in the like in the middle the furthest from anything and i would fish for gts and bonefish and hopefully per, maybe permit if there's yeah. permit out there maybe i have to go to the indian ocean for permit but i know there's a species in Indo, the indo-pacific permit yeah. i think there's some in pacific but permit bonefish and gts if i could go try on to get some them, remote atoll on a remote you bring atoll. in anybody tally i bring my dog <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you're if you're subscribed to to Will's YouTube channel, you don't hear from for a couple months. That's where he's at. Exactly. Hopefully, dude, that would be a sick trip. On foot too. On oh the, yeah. On the beach. Oh, you got to waiting. I've got a friend that uh, she has a YouTube channel and she's solo sailing around the world, and I haven't got there with Skiff Wander, but I've like been dying to like reach out to her and be like, hey, can I just have you sail me to some of these remote islands? Cause she's like down in the in the South Pacific right now. Like I've thought about calling, like like hitting her up and be like, "You mind if? Uh, can you just sail me to a couple of these islands real quick?" <laughs> That'd be so sweet. Dude, it would be so sweet. Fishing that's never been touched, you know, exploratory fly fishing on the edge of the earth. That's the God. most fun experiences. Dude, I love it. <clears throat> this is the first time someone said that. Really? Yeah. You just gave away your secret exploratory fly fishing no like like get on a boat and go into an atoll in the middle of nowhere just oh yeah GTs. i mean i've been dreaming of doing that for years dude it hasn't happened yet someday every time i would take we would take the ship through like the south pacific you go past all of these like no named atolls and you see them and you're just like let me just stop for a few hours just imagine <laughs> the flip-flops you could throw out there that would get eaten <laughs> maybe the birds Oh my goodness. All right. So listen, guys, Will has a YouTube channel, Phelps on the Fly, PH, not F. It's not a swimming channel. It's not, it has nothing to do with, yeah, it's not about the, what is it, butterfly stroke. Yeah, no butterfly strokes. <laughs> <laughs> now I really wish we had filmed a segment of you in the river doing a butterfly stroke so we'd be like oh it's a phelps on the fly yeah then we could get the uh the analytics from all the people that search for michael phelps videos and they would come to the fly fishing world and then yeah. we'd have more outreach strategic <laughs> strategic business model all right so if you're watching will's youtube channel he might be doing some more swimming segments in his videos yeah and more backflips you'll see pete doing a backflip in the next video oh. in slow motion Oh, good. That's going to look good. 10 out of 10. Gold star. <sighs> All right. So uh, links down below. Check out Will's um, YouTube channel. I'm going to leave links for the Insta. What's your Instagram? Phelps underscore 406. Okay. Check out. Check him out on Instagram. And, uh, yeah. Thanks for having me, Pete. Thanks, Dude, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm tired too. Tell. We fished hard. Dude, we fished hard for two days. Dude, you got to drive. Thank you for having me up here. Um, you have to come to Texas. I will. When you get this van van rigged out, we're going to do some cool stuff with it in Texas. I'm so down. You can't, don't twist my arm. I love redfish. I love saltwater. Like, let's, let's do it. Next production. I won't bring my skiff though. We'll use your skiff. I got an idea we'll talk about it after we get done with this. Okay, we'll keep it secret. All right, see you. Thanks, bye. <laughs> <laughs>